Welcome, welcome. I'm happy Thursday. Happy Friday Eve. Welcome to Ask Serena. It's Janine Truitt. Turn it around. Hey, everybody. Let me fix my camera just a smidge. No. Cancel. Thank you for joining. Wow. Hey, Kimberly. Welcome. This is Ask Serena Live. I'm Janine Truitt. This is my little show I do every week, every Thursday at 11 p.m. And it is just my take on wanting to talk about everything from the world of work to technology to motherhood and everything in between. So that's a little bit about this show. I'll tell you a little bit about me. I am Janine Truitt. I am the Chief Innovations Officer for Talent Think Innovations, LLC. And I'm based in Port Jefferson Station, New York. My business is a business strategy consulting firm where I focus on HR and talent management strategy, digital marketing strategy, executive coaching, and overall business strategy uh, advisement for tech startups, small to mid-sized businesses, and women-owned businesses as well. So that's a little bit about what I do. I know that was a mouthful, but that's what I do. And you can obviously check out more about my business um, with the link that Kimberly provided to my website. So what are we dealing with tonight? We're talking about technology disruption. And I know it seems kind of abstract maybe to some to have that discussion, but I think it's very relevant. Um, and I am one of those people that really, really is excited about what's to come, um, but also understand people who may not be as excited or don't know if they should be excited or scared about what's to come down the pike in terms of how fast things are developing in technology. So I like to make things simpler for those people because I feel like we can't thoroughly enjoy the fruits of what's to come unless everybody comes along and understands what's happening and how it's gonna impact them in business and in life. So that's why I felt the need to kind of tackle this topic tonight and hopefully we'll have a really good conversation about technology and your feelings around it and um, you know some of the things that are gonna be coming because some of it is just wild, like literally wild. Um, before I start though, Hopefully tonight, you guys are not seeing a shadow or any kind of pixelation. I mentioned last week that there's been a thing for like a few weeks now where when I watch the replays, I see a little bit of pixelation or there seems to be a shadow over me. So just know that I'm seeing everything very clearly. Um, and I apologize on behalf of Periscope if for whatever reason you lose me for a second or two, but it's not me, it's them. Um, and obviously when it goes up on my YouTube later, it's not looking crazy at all. So just wanted to kind of throw that out there before we jump into things. So every week, every time I touch a topic, I always do my share of research and I try to provide you all with some kind of um, guide or some articles that you can actually look at and see a little bit more about the topics that I'm talking about and go a little bit more in depth. So here are the articles for this week. So this week we have, uh, the faster a new technology takes off, the harder it falls. And that is by wired.com. Um, I also took a look at this article called Magic Leap gives a glimpse into our augmented reality future. This one was pretty cool. I can't wait to discuss this one with you. That was a Newsweek article. And then there is science fiction. We are robots. We are the robots. Science fiction becomes fact. And this article is actually on a website that I contribute for called irs.xyz. Phenomenal site for financial professionals, um, but they really look to curate um, content from a lot of different genres, technology, HR, leadership, um, life, just in general, life advice, great website. But anyway, that's um, the article that I pulled from. And the last article is convincing skeptical employees 
to adopt new technology. And that was an HBR article. So those are the articles that will be informing our conversation tonight. So, you know, technology in my head and also I think in reality has just taken off I would say very much so in the past 10 years. Like I don't think that we've ever seen the disruption that we've seen so quickly um, in my entire lifetime, which is over 30 something years. Um, it's just happened so quickly in the past 10 years. Like I literally can remember the early 2000s for sure, not really even using email like not using email at all, um, knowing that it existed, knowing that it was some sort of vessel to communicate with people, but I didn't really even own an email or it wasn't an obligation for me to do so. Um, there certainly wasn't anything called the cloud at that particular point or nothing to my knowledge. The biggest thing, you know, early 2000s for me was I remember... I used to do my papers, my college papers on three and a half inch floppy disk, if anybody is old enough to remember that. And basically, I remember seeing somebody in my computer lab with this thing called a zip drive, which at that time, and we're talking like 2003, 2004, that was kind of like, oh, what is a zip drive? And I was still on my floppy disk or whatever, quite happy with that. But fast forward to now, I live by my zip drives, live by it, could not function in business, in life without my zip drives. So it's just kind of interesting, um, you know, how we kind of ease our way into the technology and just how things kind of happen. And I think the reason for that story and why that even becomes important is because I think there's a lot of fear around technology in general. Um, and so you have what I actually read up on. There's a book, another thing you may want to read called uh, Crossing the Chasm. And it's written by a guy named Je um, Jeffrey Moore. It was written back in 91. So I know like that's like a whole lifetime ago, but there's some things in it that I think are very relevant to today. And basically he was just trying to kind of like double down on this whole theory that was developed by a sociologist called, named uh, Everett Rogers, who was basically trying to understand the differences in how people adopt technology across a continuum. Um, so, you know, he had these different buckets. He basically had the innovators, which are the people that were either developing, um, said products or technology or the people who are, um, you know, at the forefront of really embracing the technology. And then you had like the early adopters. So the early adopters are the people that are like, as soon as it's out on market, I'm after it. I want that. I'm getting it. You know, they just are believers. They're, they're, they're Those are your enthusiasts, if you will, right? And then the early majority, that's just about when you start to see that chasm. So when I say chasm, um, it's really just a difference in terms of how people adopt things. And so that's where you really saw the difference, at least from his perspective in the book, um, because those are the people that needed a little bit more to be convinced about why this technology would be helpful, useful, effective. Um, so they were making more informed decisions like, is this a company I like? Does this company consistently put out great products? All of these kinds of things. This was back in 91. And it's interesting because the article that um, references it, which is that Wired article, the first one that I named, is kind of giving it a spin like it's a bit outdated and not really something relevant to now. But I can definitely see how it's applicable now. Like, definitely. Hey, Letaria. So that early majority really starts to ask some questions, right? And then you start getting into the late majority who are much more... Um, later in the continuum in terms of adopting technology, um, they have even more questions than the early majority and need even more convincing. And then you have your laggards who 
are completely just tuned out. They still teach it in college. Oh, really? See? There you go. I mean, not that everything they teach in college is relevant. That was last week's conversation. But I think that it's important to understand. Um, so, yeah, the laggards, they just don't care. They're just not convinced. They may never come around. Those are like your naysayers. Like, they may never come around to the technology. Um, but, you know, you have to consider them as well. So, you know, I thought that was interesting. I mean, basically what the Wired uh, article is trying to say is that that's no longer the case, that basically we have so much information now that companies are just kind of putting out the best possible, best possible product. And, you know, as soon as that rises, it's basically sure to fall and or plateau at some point. So there's really no true time, I guess, in the traditional sense for people to, you know, kind of build the momentum around a product and get the attention of those innovators, early adopters in order to kind of harness it so that they can market it to all these other harder groups of people that there are to market it to. They just kind of have to throw it out there as best as possible, prototype or not, and um, hope that they're putting out something that's useful and also be able to understand what the time frame is um, that they have where they've actually captured the consumer's attention and heart long enough to be profitable. So I guess this is where the whole concept, if you are anybody that's played around in the investor space, then you know that investors are huge on exit strategy. So like this is not something I operate under um, because when I started my business, I started my business with the mindset of I'm going to start this business. It's going to be something I grow and it's possibly something like a legacy that I can leave to my family. Dealing in the investor space, I now understand that they don't kind of think in this way. Their thing is, you know, what are you, what problem are you solving? How quickly can you solve it? How quickly can we go to market? And when we get to market, just about the time that you actually get to market and start to become profitable, where they can get their money back, they want you to kind of figure out when you're getting out of it. And part of it is around this whole concept of there's a lot of uncertainty around how long you can sustain that longevity and that attention and that hype around a tech project or a tech product, I should say, in this day and age with the way that everything's moving just so rapidly. So it's very interesting. But to my initial point, I just find in talking to people about technology that I've, I have like two different levels of people. So I don't meet a lot of people that are kind of middle of the way where they're skeptical. Although I think the vast majority of consumers are skeptical. I think they want to know how they're spending their money and that it makes sense for them to spend their money. So there's something to that. But I either deal with people who are enthusiasts, which is kind of what I am. Um, I don't know that I would call myself an early adopter. I would say I'm probably a cautious early adopter or I'm probably like an early majority because I kind of want to see, you know, how does this whole thing work? How is it going to work? Is it working for people before I invest in it? So I'm somewhere between innovation and early majority. Um, the other set of people that I tend to run into are just complete laggards. They're afraid of technology um, and they're, they somehow think that there is a doom and gloom where it's concerned, which is completely um, understandable. Tech conscious is what? Right. Yeah. So I, I think it's important to be um, cognizant of it. I don't know. Not a techie, but. Right. And so like I can I can understand that completely. Like I don't think everybody needs to be an innovator or early adopter. I I don't think that that's the case at all. They're probably like 1 to 5%. If that's if that. That's probably high. 1 to 2%, right? Um but I I'm interested in the fact that people don't even want to have that consciousness. So like 
I completely get you, Lateria, but there are people that just don't even have a consciousness about what's going on. So let's like talk about what's going on because I've been to quite a few events over the past few years that even for me being an enthusiast have blown my mind. And I'm pretty sure a lot of people don't really, really know. Um, they may hear things, but they're not really invested in it. So I'm going to be your vessel tonight and kind of give you an idea of where things are going. So let's talk, for instance, last year I was at IBM Insight and also TED at IBM. And there was a lot of talk about augmented reality and virtual reality. So like I'm an 80s baby. So the virtual reality thing to me, like in the 80s, that was kind of the science fiction, if you will. You know, like that wasn't anything that anybody could even begin to wrap their mind around, but it was fascinating. Like I think anybody that grew up in that time frame was just fascinated with those possibilities, the back to the futures and the terminators and all of that kind of stuff. And it's really not so much science fiction anymore. It really isn't. It's actually becoming a thing. So, you know, last year it was first said, this is going to be the year of virtual reality and augmented reality. So let me give you the distinction. Virtual reality basically transforms what you know as reality. So like I'm sitting here in a physical office with virtual reality, I'm able to put on a headset and basically be transformed somewhere else. So some of the things that I've heard is that eventually this will like transform things like travel. Whereas now we get on a plane and we fly someplace, that may not be so much the case. Maybe I'll sit in this very chair I'm sitting in right now and I'll put on a headset and I'll say, hey, I wanna go to Dubai and the virtual reality headset will transform me to Dubai and I will, in effect, from a sensory and um, cognitive standpoint, believe that I'm in Dubai and function as though I was on vacation there, although I have never left my home. Now, I know that sounds crazy, but this is actually a thing. Like, these are things that are being worked on. So the thing to know about virtual reality is that this year, there are a lot of products being launched. I won't even like waste the time to actually list them all, but like Microsoft has a product. I believe Google has a product that's hitting market. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, but the thing is, is the technology is not perfect. It's not perfect yet. And so we haven't gotten there, but the, the goal, and that's what I'm always interested in, because once you have somebody working on these technologies, and they've already decided where they wanna see this go, it's very likely that it's gonna end up there eventually. And so this whole thing about travel blew my mind. I remember when I couldn't fathom. Right, absolutely. This same, listen, I was I was on a flip phone just a second ago. I You missed it, Lataria, in the beginning. I kind of took them back a little bit and talked about like just how quickly we've arrived where we are now because I was saying in college, I was on a three and a half floppy disk doing my papers. All my papers in college are on a three and a half floppy disk. And I was saying that I remember somebody being in my computer lab and I remember them talking about this zip drive. And I was like, the hell is a zip drive? Like, what is that? And I just couldn't be bothered. And I remember going to the bookstore. Yes, the floppy disk. I'm dating myself, I know. But like, yeah, that, <laughs> I, you know, sometimes I'd like to like go back and see like what I wrote in college. And I have no way of seeing that now because it's all on those three and a half um, floppy disks. But I remember going to the bookstore and saying, let me look into the zip drive. See, remember, I'm the innovator enthusiast. So I was, even though it was foreign to me, I wanted to know more. And it was friggin' expensive. It was really expensive. I feel like the initial zip drives were like in the realm of um, mid-20s to high $30 for the zip drives. Yeah. As 88 <laughs> Yep. <laughs> absolutely so um yeah I it's just so thinking about that thinking about the fact like my first phone ever was an analog cell phone like I don't know if anybody had those right 
analog Nokia, you know, push button. And then, you know, I thought I was somebody when I got to the flip phone and that was a thing. So it's just amazing how fast this thing has happened. So anyway, let me give you, so the virtual reality, that's that, right? Um, I have, snake was my, <laughs> I never got into the snake, but I had a lot of friends that were into that for sure. Um, so I have a problem, like there's a very, very um, thin line between the virtual reality and augmented because to me they're they're kind of the same so let me give you a, a picture of augmented reality augmented reality is like this live or indirect um i guess supplementation of reality but it's like facilitated by a computer so essentially what it is it's kind of like what a hologram is if you think of a hologram it's not physical, yet it's placed in your physical space so you can see it. You can't touch it, but it's it's kind of, you know, present in the physical space that you're in. If you were to have a hologram in front of you, if you can kind of imagine that. So augmented reality is like this. And I really encourage you, if you want to see it like in play, check out the Magic Leap article that I mentioned at the beginning of the scope because... They, this magic leap is actually working on augmented reality technology. And it's basically like what we do on our phones, which is very tactile. Like we have to touch things and swipe things. This is basically transposing what we do into the air. And so you'd be sitting, like I'd be sitting at my desk where I'm at right now. And I'd see my phone is ringing or my daughter is sending me a text message and be able to tap in the sky or in the air, right, on what I'm seeing. And it would have the right. It would have the exact same purpose as Microsoft HoloLens has a great YouTube. Yes. Yes. Yep. The screens float in the air. Exactly. And so I think... You know, aside from everyday use, they're trying to get this also for use in um, military as well as healthcare, um, trying to give doctors a different view of how they can conduct surgery, um, surgeries and different procedures and things like of that nature. So, you know, there are obviously some very altruistic um, values around some of this stuff. Um, one of the other articles, and that would have been probably, I think it's the Wired article, the first one that I put up. They talk about um, some of this getting into the realm of like having relationships with computers. So this is very interesting to me. I mean, basically what they're saying is by 2020, computers are going to be able to think faster than humans. We have some levels now. That's crazy. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. I I saw I saw a lot talking. Yep. So the robot, so that robot um is part of like kind of a legion of robots that keep popping up. So I met or at least I got to see Pepper. That was the first one I found out about last year. That was at IBM Insight. Pepper is a cognitive technology. So Pepper, although you would think of her as artificial intelligence, can think, can learn, cumulatively learns like a human, but learns at a faster rate. So the more that she's in an experience with you as a human being and understands how you think, how you move, what is favorable and not, she's constantly processing all of those instances and then some to understand how to better serve you the next time you have a certain conversation with her. So like, for instance, I could be saying to her like, and this goes to for the one that you saw, Lataria, I think that robot's name was Al. Um, basically, I could be saying to Al like, hey, I need a recipe. I want like Mexican recipes. I want to mix up like what I'm cooking every week. Can you just get me a Mexican recipe? Al will say yes. We'll find me a Mexican recipe. We'll then think, 
you know what, you weren't specific about what you said about Mexican. Do you have any specific kind of Mexican food that you want to cook? And then even after Al delivers it, we'll be thinking constantly about what we discussed. And so the next time when I ask a question for a recipe, he's going to say, hey, do you want to cook Mexican today? Because I've got these 20 recipes for you waiting on Mexican food. Or can I get you something else? Because I've also got other genres of food because you seem like the kind of person who likes to cook a lot of different things like this. Guys, I know that was a mouthful. This is where it's going. Literally, we're like artificial intelligence is thinking like us. And so a lot of the articles are now saying like, you know, it's going to become very difficult. Yes. Girl, listen, Letaria, <laughs> when I saw that pepper, I was like, oh my God, I want pepper in my house like now. Like I want her to be my friend. <laughs> I know that's so crazy, but that's how I felt. I was like, she can help me get my recipes in order. She will understand me as a person and what makes me tick. Maybe she can help me on those rough days when I don't feel like anybody in the universe understands me. Like, I want a pepper. I do want a pepper. But, you know, the thing is with everything that we've just mentioned, like all of these old technologies and how we've gotten here it's always it always comes at a price point right so like I'm gonna really date myself now I can remember back when we were on VCRs right VCRs and VCRs were cheap because VCRs were the thing like back in the early 80s and then DVDs came out and so like that was like whoo DVD you know that's like not even blu-ray just DVDs and they were like $150 just for a DVD player. And the DVDs were like $40. So you, with all this technology, there's always a price point that like you have to decide as the consumer, like when do you want to buy in? And that's the whole piece about this crossing the chasm and innovators versus, you know, early majority and late majority. Like when do you want to kind of buy in? And so I don't know what they're going to start to charge, you know, for some of these technologies, the virtual reality, um, augmented, the peppers of the world. I assume it's going to be several thousand dollars until it becomes so mainstream that then everybody else can start to buy in at, you know, an average price. So I think we're a ways off Lateria from getting our pepper. I'm pretty certain that when it does go to market, at grand scale, she's going to be quite expensive, quite, quite expensive. So for now, I'll be happy with my Alexa that I use through my Amazon TV. I'll just be happy for that. Um, but yeah, these are just kind of some of the things that are coming down. And so another thing about the robots, and it's in one of these articles as well, um, is they this kind of freaked me out. I'm not going to lie. So the one about robots, this is the one on irs.xyz. I contribute for them. They talked about this ability for humans to kind of become romantically involved with robots. Let that sink in for a second. They go further to talk about us even procreating with artificial intelligence. So they're basically saying we could like procreate without, yes, yes, Letaria, without a man and that this person in effect would be, it would be done like in a test tube with stem cells. The fact that they went so in depth on this topic leads me to believe that someone is cooking this up in a Petri dish or some lab somewhere in the world. May not be in the US, but somewhere somebody's working on this. So that, yeah, the person, whoever is born of this will be a little synthesia, as they call it, and a little human. And they say, you know, who wants a baby by the great, the great many? Somebody somewhere, you better know it. Because there's some really undesirable stuff going on in the human race and people procreate with that. So I wouldn't be the least bit shocked to find that somebody would 
go to the extent of doing that. But it kind of bugged me out just a little bit because I'm like, really? Half and half? Cyborgs? Like, is this... This can't be real. But they're saying that it's completely possible. And so, you know, one of the questions I had... um and this was like several conferences ago, was what happens when you've got robots and humans in the workforce, right? I'm a, let's, let's take a workforce look. What happens when you have both of them there working, living amongst one another? Does the robot then have to have rights, right? Because like here in the US and many other places in the world, there is employment law governing how we get treated how we get paid, all of this stuff. So now, like, do we have to extend the same rights that we would to a human to a robot? I, I'm guessing at some point we would. And so a lot of these articles are saying basically that the technology will be so savvy and, and so dynamic that you really will have very little to go on in terms of knowing who is truly human and who is this robot. Like that's where it's going. We're talking like iRobot kind of stuff. And so it, it's very, there's so many ethical, moral considerations where this is concerned, like just so much when you start talking about something man-made having rights and um, having feelings and being romantically involved and being able to reproduce like this defies everything we've ever known. Um, and certainly, you know, those that are more towards the religious ends of things, not so much secular, like this will be like blasphemous to them that we'd even be talking about a human procreating with something that isn't human. Um, but, you know, at that point, we'll have to redefine and, and think about what does it really truly mean to be human? Because here's the thing. You have something that walks, talks, feels. I don't know if they'll eat. Um, thinks, has a cognitive system in which they can process information and outputs and and interacts with the world in a way that a human does. Can you deny them humanity? Then I'm I'm being so abstract tonight, guys. But like, bear with me. Like literally, like, can you deny them rights? Can you deny them that there's some human aspect to them when they do all of those things? This is where the technology is going. It's just. It's it's kind of crazy. It's it's definitely a source of fear, but it's almost something to be excited about because the thing is this, it's always been we've always been eased into it. So I think people are like, "Oh my god, oh my god, they keep talking about virtual reality. They keep talking about this technology is going to take this job away from people or whatever." And it's like, "You know what? We've always been eased into it. Just like we we, we're sitting here now and we're saying like, holy crap, that was just like yesterday that I had an analog phone. And that was just like yesterday that I had a Nextel or a sidekick or, you know, whatever. Right. I remember not even wanting Facebook. Literally, when I was in college, Facebook was such that you had to have a college email address in order to even get um, an account with them. Yeah, I was one of them. I was one of them. And I remember being in college and one of my best girlfriends was like, hey, there's this thing called Facebook. She's like, you should get on it. It's really cool. I was like, nah, I'm good. Facebook is good. Right? And so she was an early adopter in that regard. And at that time, it was only for college students. You couldn't even get on Facebook if you didn't have a college email address. So, but then fast forward, like maybe five, six years after this thing just exploded, that went away. The whole college aspect went away and they just kept, you know, then it became the social media thing. And I still wasn't an early adopter. I was very much a, I would call myself a laggard 
where it came to Facebook. Like I, that was one I really wanted no parts of. Um, but eventually I hopped on it and now I can't get rid of it. Still not really in love to be quite frank, but I use it. It does have its uses. I have met a lot of great people. Um, the reconnection thing I don't much care about, but yeah. So, you know, I say all that to say that we've always been eased into it, eased into it. I'm one of those generations where I can remember, you know, stuff that most younger millennials can't, right? Like I was the generation that grew up on rotary phones and then saw the rotary phones turn to the push button phones and then, you know, on and on and on. I remember when answering machines happened, I had a TV I had to click through with an antenna, you know, so I've kind of really, I'm one of those sandwich generations I feel like that has really seen and been part of the old school technology and seeing how it's blossomed to now. And so, you know, like I, I kind of find myself from an emotional standpoint, I'm in the middle in the sense that I am very enthusiastic about what can be. And I'll certainly try most things like I'm not a laggard across the board, but I'm also kind of like, you know, certain things, just like what I said about this whole thing of procreating that I'm not going to lie, kind of freaks me out. Whereas, you know, maybe somebody now who's growing up in just this boom of technology may feel like, oh, cool. I, I date a cyborg, you know, <laughs> like, I don't know. I, so, you know, it's very, very different perspective, but I can certainly know that like my aunts who are boomers and, you know, even traditionalists would probably hear some of this stuff and be like, what? Oh my God, please, Lord, call me home before all of this happens because this is crazy. And, you know, it, like I said, it's, it's really quite far-fetched, some of these things, but it's going to happen. If they're talking about it, it's going to happen. And we're going to just be eased into it. We're going to be eased into it little by little. Like this is the first year, aside from me hearing about virtual reality and augmented reality, that I'm finally starting to see it in application and seeing things on the market and, and seeing it talked up in the media. So we're, you know, already they're trying to ease us into it. The other aspect of it is this, the internet of things. So if you don't know what the internet of things are, is, or IOT, it's basically this whole concept that everything that we have is connected through the internet, right? So we're already starting to get that. And what do I mean by that? That means that basically the internet gets to power everything. So we have things like, um, I know a few years ago, you know, ADT had a product that they put out, Pulse, where, you know, from your smartphone, you can basically see what's going on in your house through a camera. You can manipulate the lights in your house, turn them on, turn them off, um, that kind of thing. This is what the Internet of Things are. So like this year, again, this is another topic that I just see blossoming that's been spoken about for a few years now, but now you're starting to see more of the connectedness. So, you know, things like from your mobile device, if you want to turn your washing machine on, you know, Whirlpool will be building apps so that you can actually turn your washing machine on. Let's just say if you're like 10 minutes out from your house and you want to get that load done, things like that. Um, you're on vacation, you can't be home. Maybe you don't have family members in the area that can look after your house. Well, you can look after your house. You have a mobile device. You can tap into some central system and basically be able to turn the lights on so it looks as though people are home. You can kind of look around the house. You know, you maybe you forgot to turn on the dishwasher. You can hit the dishwasher from your phone. So it's all of these, it, everything in the next few years is going to be interconnected and probably of everything that I've actually just mentioned this is the one that concerns me the most and I'm going to tell you why it's not that I won't love the fact that I can do everything and control everything from one dashboard or from my mobile device but my concern is is the privacy and security aspect so we already don't have the security aspect well 
handled, right? There's always somebody getting hacked. There's always a cyber security situation. And so my thing is like, what if somebody like hacks into your system or hacks into whatever the main mainframe is for any of this stuff? And then can you just imagine everything is hooked up to the internet? So imagine you're getting home from work. You don't have keys anymore. Somebody's hacked the system. How are you supposed to get in your house? Your house is locked down. Your, your lights are going off crazy. You can't get your machine to work. It's doing craziness. Like I'm, this is what I'm imagining. And it's very likely to happen. Like none of these technologies are perfect now. And they'll certainly perfect them over time. But they're still never going to be perfect. No technology is. So at some point, we're going to get to a point where there's going to be some craziness. Like somebody's not going to be able to get in their house. Somebody's not going to have lights. Somebody's washing machine is going to be churning and spitting out clothes or some some craziness. And it's all because we're consolidating all of these things in the spirit of making things easier for people. So, you know, I think that there is definitely a need and I think a lot of people will buy into it, but I think, you know, there is a, a threshold of going overboard where the internet of things comes in. Security companies are already going in hackers are. They are, for sure. Correct. Yeah. If we can't stop them from ha hacking, I mean, big corporations can't seem to get a handle on them hacking their systems for people's personally identifiable information, right? Their PII. They can't even stop that. So let alone all of this stuff, it's going to be crazy. I So I'll give you a, a for instance before I let you all go. A few years ago, I they this is talking about coming along. My first kid, I had a re very regular monitor, right? One that you have to listen to, to hear their movements and so forth. When I had my second the video monitors were all the rage. So I'm like, oh, well, that would be cool because then I wouldn't have to just listen. I could actually see that she's okay and she's not rolled over or she's not entangled in anything. Perfect. So we buy, we register for this video monitor. Great, fantastic. Except then like, I think a year into using it, here comes the news report. Oh, be careful with those video monitors people are hacking into the baby monitors now to see what's going on in people's houses. What? I was like, the best possible thing that I think I found in terms of being able to monitor my child and people are hacking into that. And the thing is, is that that monitor, they hadn't even gotten as advanced as having it tap into Wi-Fi yet. It was just a camera. So the idea that the hackers had figured out a way to just hack into something that wasn't even on the grid is mind blowing. And so like to your point, Letaria, like just crazy. So, you know, I share all of this stuff because I do get exposed a lot to new technology, to what's happening next. I get exposed to the analysts and the thinkers and I'm always thinking again, I'm a tech enthusiast. I'm coming from that perspective. So I like to share what I know, what I'm hearing with others. One, because it helps me kind of debrief myself on what I just heard, because some of it's kind of wild. Um, but also because I understand that for some people, this is just mind blowing, mind blowing, unfathomable. There's a source of fear. And the media, quite frankly, doesn't do a good job of, you know, making people feel comfortable with this information. Anytime something like this happens, they put it out there and it's almost like a very um, doom and gloom. Yes, very stressful. They, It's all the messaging. The messaging is very wrong. The messaging is very, very wrong. Like it's always coming over as a doom and gloom kind of thing and or they'll say something like, you know, um, either you adopt the technology or perish. 
you know, like that'll be the headline, you know, disrupt or be disrupted. Like that's been used a gazillion times. And so for somebody who doesn't one, understand the technology to understand the value proposition, and then they see that kind of headline, you shut them down right from the gate. Like 